Good morning, St. Andrews. So happy to have you with us today. Um, whether you're sitting here in the sanctuary or you are at home, um, watching from your own, um, your own house, your own couch, regardless, we're so happy that we can still all worship together. Um, I am Jane Rideout. I'm one of the uh, co-leads for St. Andrews. My husband Gary and I are still relatively new to this church. We came this past summer and we're just really excited to be with you. And today we're going to be celebrating and blessing something that is a tradition of St. Andrews for the past 10 years. What you're seeing here are quilts. These belong to a group of women at this church who over in, in 2020 met every week until the COVID and then they just worked independently at home to sew, to quilt 100 blankets. And so this is amazing. These gorgeous quilts, and they are all de designated to go first to the um, Mountain Hearts, which is for kids in crisis. And so the, the kids from that place will get these quilts, and they will receive them as a Christmas gift to take home with them. And then the smaller quilts go to the um, neonatal unit at Brandon Hospital. And if you are in that unit, you receive a quilt, and it covers you to protect you from the light, and then you take that home with you as well. Um, there are about 28 women who participate in this amazing ministry, and I just, it just kind of knocked me over when they laid them all out this morning. This is really amazing, and it goes to confirm what we talked about last week, that United Methodists understand it's not just enough to say you believe. There should be action to go with your words, and this is action in spite of a pandemic these women stayed in ministry. So I'd like to bless the children and say a prayer over the, of, over the quilts, bless the kids who are going to receive it, as well as those who um, created them. So will you join me in prayer? Loving God, we thank you for um, the children who will each receive one of these blankets, whether they're older kids or, or little infants who are not even aware. May they be blessed and may they, this be an expression of your love and your grace to them and to their families. Loving God, I just ask that as they grow up, it will be a remembrance that they are special, that they are set aside, that they are children of God. And Father, I don't know how you will use it, and how, but just let this be just an expression of your ongoing grace and your ongoing love in, in the lives of these kids. And I lift up all those who worked all through this pandemic to sew these hundred quilts, and I ask that you will bless them um, as, they, as they give away um, by using their gifts and talents for the kingdom of God. Bless them, loving God, as they continue to do this ministry. And we thank you for all the ways that it impacts us here at St. Andrews. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, I've got two announcements for you um, before we kind of dive into worship. Um, one of them is still kind of shocking me a little bit. Starting next week after this service at 1215, we will start Hanging of the Greens. Now, if you don't know what hanging of the greens is, that's when we as a, a family, a church family, begin to decorate the sanctuary because the follow, for, for Christmas because the following Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. And so this is a big thing because we, we decorate the sanctuary in the narthex and part of Disciples Hall as well as over um, the, um, the Family Life Center. There's lots of work to be done, and it takes a lot of people. And so if you were to go to saumc.org, live, no, dot life, I get that wrong every time, dot life, um, you can go and register or just go to our website and register and let us know that you're going to help. We could use all of your help and you can get to decide where you want to help even when you're signing up and we just really could use your help and the more there are working, the quicker we'll get this job done. So I'm really excited about that. So that's coming up next Sunday. In addition, we've got something new we're doing this year and it also is around next Sunday. These are called do-it-yourself Advent wreaths kits. So what we're doing is that we're going to give you an opportunity to buy an Advent wreath do-it-yourself kit. And what it is, it's a kit so that you can make your own Advent wreath to take home with you. An Advent wreath is a, has all the candles for each week of Advent. And there'll be a little booklet and some ways that you can light the candle and read scripture and just really create a spiritual moment at home each week for you or your family or your grandkids. You don't have to have kids to do that. Gary and I will have one in our house and we'll do it one night each, um, each week during dinner. But it's just some intentionality so that you're just not just racing through this very weird season this year. Because let's admit it, um, the Advent season will be strange this year because everything is strange. 
And so this is, might be an opportunity to just have the little moments of, of, re of reflection and quiet and remembering the season. So those will be also, they're on sale right now, and you can go and order a kit. They're just $10. And the next week, you can pick them up over in the gazebo. So all morning long, they'll be available in the gazebo for just to pick it up. So this is just something that you do for yourself, for your family, your grandkids, whatever. Just this, this opportunity to be intentionally remembering the season. Okay, I think those are our two announcements. Um, I want to encourage you um, to join us in worship. So whether you're at home or whether you're here, um, this is real worship, even when you're doing it remotely. Um, this is our way to gather, and so we're so grateful we have that opportunity. So let's continue worshiping. Please stand for the song of praise. time that I ask you to turn around and look beside you and wave and give a air high five to people around you. Let them know that you're here and thinking about them. And if you're at home, this is time to give some love to those people around you or maybe text somebody or send an email. Just let them know that you're thinking about them. Hi, friends. I'm Miss Nancy. I'm Zach. And we're for the children's ministry. And this week, we want to share with you our story and how God protects us when times are hard. This week, our lesson continues on in Nehemiah in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. So at this time, the walls that were around Jerusalem that Nehemiah and his friends had built had been destroyed burned to the ground. But Nehemiah knew God's purpose for him was to build that wall around the city to protect the people. So he gathered the people again and started to rebuild that wall. But this time, things were way different. In fact, many of the people that had helped him build that wall before, they didn't want to rebuild it. In fact, they thought, why should I rebuild the wall that I just built? Because it's just going to be torn down again. And there were lots of negative people around that were laughing at him, that were putting him down, telling him that he can't do this. But you know what he did? That didn't stop him. Instead of giving up, instead of listening to all of that negative talk, he actually prayed. This is a great time for Zachary to share with you what he does. Hey guys, I'm Miss Nancy's son. My name is Zach and I'm going to tell you how I talk to God. So usually whenever I play sports, I play soccer, volleyball, etc. Whenever I play sports, I like to talk to God before I start the game. He gives me protection, but usually I'll just ask him for protection and just stay with me afterwards so that my body's not sore. But you don't always have to do it before sports. You could do it for anything. Like if you're about to take a test at school, you could say to God that you need protection and guidance through your test so then you can have help and know that you're not alone. So here's your call to action. Each week, 
of November, we are actually doing a Bible challenge. So if anybody out there is in need of a Bible, just get in touch with the kids' ministry and we'll get you one so you can join us. This week's challenge is to read your Bible in the most unusual spot. Should you accept this challenge, we would love to see where are you reading your Bible in the most unusual place. So send us a pic. We would love to share it. Now it's time for us to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this moment to be together with our friends and family and to be closer to you. I pray that you'll help us all remember that when times are hard, you will always be there to protect us so that we can be the best that we can be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Stand for the hymn. Uh, good morning. We're in a sermon series uh, entitled uh, Igniting Hope. It's a, it's a series where we're revisiting and uh, uh, re re looking forward toward the vision of this church in a time where we're kind of regroup from all that is going on in this world and the community, the trying to bounce back from the COVID-19 pandemic that in some ways doesn't seem it's ever going to end. It's peaking again, but then we're seeing a ray of hope, aren't we? Uh, a light at the end of the tunnel because there's a this, there's news of a vaccine and we're we're refocusing on the vision of this church by looking at the old testament uh, leader uh, nehemiah who was a jewish leader that lived in the fifth century bc so jane introduced us to nehemiah last week uh, he lived during the time of what was called the babylonian captivity a time when the jews were taken away from their homeland from Judea, the area around Jerusalem, they were captured and they were taken to live in exile in Babylon. For 50 years they lived in Babylon and away from their homes as slaves to another nation. Yet later when the Persians conquered the Babylonians, some of the Israelites were allowed to go back and to help rebuild the temple. But when they went back, they, they were heartbroken. Their spirits were shattered. The city was in ruins. The temple was in ruins. And, and the city was shattered. But still, God provided leadership to the remnant of Jews that went back so they could rebuild the temple and take on that task. Now, Nehemiah at first was still back in, in the land of Babylonia, the formerly Babylon, now Persia, as part of the, the king's court in Persia. And he was the one the ones brought over from Jerusalem, but he, he was allowed to go back later on and take leadership of rebuilding the wall around the city. And not only did the king allow him to return, but also gave him a, a plentiful supply of timber to help him rebuild. And a strong wall for the Jerusalem was needed to protect them from enemies, you know, even wild animals, protect them from wild animals, and also to protect them from harsh weather. But the it was more than that. 
a strong visible wall was a symbol, a symbol to the people in Jerusalem and around Jerusalem. As long as the wall lay shattered, the Jews were ashamed, they were disgraced. Now the temple was being restored. The, the temple was, was uh, renovated. But without a wall, the city appeared to outsiders as the city was still in shambles. It was destroyed. It was without hope. Without the wall, the people themselves felt defeated. Uh, a wall around the city told the neighboring nations, we're back, and God is still on our side. They needed the sign of God's presence. That wall represented God's presence. They needed the outside world to see the hand of God at work in their city. Yet the presence of the wall would bring opposition. Opposition from the traditional enemies of the Israelites, the Samaritans and the Ammonites. And uh, they were jealous, who were jealous of Israelite success and, and being sort of the chosen ones of God. Okay. That was a very long lead-in to introduce the scripture for today, to kind of give you an explanation of what's behind the scripture we're about to read in Nehemiah 4, uh, verses 1 through 6. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Now Tobiah the Ammonite, who was, on, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even a fox climbing on it, will break down the walls of stone. Now the next paragraph is what Nehemiah responds. And actually in prayer, Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half of heights, for the people worked with all their heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, now I think it's every pastor's dream that they're going to have this vision they're going to get from God, uh, secure that vision. The congregation will rally around just like Moses did. And I kind of maybe I have that vision too, that <clears throat> here I am, I'm going to go up on the mountaintop and I'm going to commune with God for a day, for a week, or for months. And people will be waiting patiently, expectantly for me to come down gazing up at the top of the mountain and wondering when, he, when is he going to come back with the word of God. Time would go by and there would be no return. Then one day the clouds would part and here I come, walking down the, the mountain, glowing with a beard down to my navel and, and, and holding a scroll. And the people would gather around the base of the mountain and they would want to hear the words of, the, words of this vision. I unroll it and read it to give them a glorious picture of what God wants us to do. And once I'm finished, the, the crowd will cheer. They'll lift me up on their shoulders. They'll carry me around triumphantly and singing praises. And we would all be one. We'd all work together in unity and no dissensions, no grumbling. And everyone would work to fulfill the vision. Well, that's just a dream. It's not reality. So it's a pure fantasy. For one thing, I'm scared of heights, so you'll probably never see me on top of a mountain. <laughs> Secondly, I'm not very good at growing a beard, and I'm six foot three and 250 pounds, so very few people want to carry me on, on their shoulders. So that's not how visions work, not even in the Bible. Moses came initially down from Mount Sinai to see his people in wild disarray. They were worshiping golden idols, and they, they were indulging in all kinds of excesses. And in the scripture passage you just read, Nehemiah's task at leading the rebuilding of the wall was, was not all smooth sailing. He faced opposition, interference, interruptions. It's a reminder to us that even if we have a vision for this church, a clear, descriptive, vivid dream, there will be challenges on the way. Everything will not come together like clockwork, smooth as silk, a piece of cake. I can't think of any more cliches, but uh, you get the picture. Fortunately, I don't have to climb up that mountaintop. Last January, a group of members of the church, uh, some of you were in that group, 
as facilitated, facilitated by Pastor JC, began reviewing and revising the vision statement as well as the mission statements of this church to paint a picture of the future of the church. I heard one pastor say in a sermon, a vision is a picture of the future that produces passion, produces passion. The group had made inroads into this, had created such a picture and came up with a vision statement that would, we could all embrace with passion. And here, here it is. Our vision is to reach people with Christ's love, create Christian community, and serve others as followers of Jesus Christ. A, a wonderful vision statement. The group was well on its way to embark on strategies to fulfill this vision. Then COVID hit. A huge obstacle, a setback to beat all setbacks. And the process abruptly stopped. So, and the Israelites in this story, in Nehemiah chapter 4, the rebuilding of the wall, they faced setbacks as well. But their setbacks were a little different than the ones we faced. First of all, they faced opposition from the historical, historical enemies of the Israelites, the, the uh, Samaritans, the Ammonites who were kind of jealous and felt the Israelites would be in a threat if they become powerful again. So they want to contain and limit the power of the people. They didn't have the power to stop the building, but they did everything they could to create a spirit of discouragement in the people that would kind of deflate their spirit and deflate their passion for the project. What did Sanballat, Sanballat of the, uh, the Samaritans say? He kind of ridiculed them in front of his own countrymen. What do these feeble Israelites think they're doing? Trying to build a wall? You gotta be kidding. Wait, did you see that wall? It's in rubble. Those stones are dead. Do they think they can have the power to bring a dead stone to life? And sure, oh yeah, they could build a wall. They could probably all do it in one day, right? And they probably got a hearty laugh from the whole crowd when saying that. And then Tobiah the Ammonite engages in a bit of 5th century BC trash talking. <laughs> Sure, they're building such a sturdy wall while even a small fox will climb on it and knock it down, which probably created some more laughs from the group. And throughout the rest of the history of this story in chapter, Nehemiah chapter 4, these enemies continue to thwart the plans of the Israelite people in Nehemiah. And they, if you read later on, they even engage in a little covert guerrilla action to sabotage the rebuilding. As St. Andrews embarks on rebooting this journey to fulfill the vision set out for this church, we, we don't really have to fear outside enemies or, um, trying to thwart our activities. There's not going to be a gang of Presbyterians and Baptists over here on our campus uh, trash-talking us and trying to discourage us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody said, you sure? Well, I guess I'm not. So. But there will be discouragements, anxieties, setbacks, adjustments, delays, disappointments that will challenge this vision. We can guarantee these things will happen. The work will seem too big. We don't have the resources nor the people to support such a vision. It will cost too much money. We don't even know the future of this church. We don't even know the future of the denomination. These are all valid points, very valid points. But I want to read a quote that has stuck with me. Visionary people face the same problems everyone else faces, but rather than get paralyzed by their problems, visionaries immediately commit themselves to finding a solution. In Jane and I's short time here at St. Andrews, we know that this church is filled with visionaries. And we know that it's filled with people who are committing to find a solution when faced with a problem. Even COVID hasn't slowed down the church that much. Outreach ministries have continued. The food pantry, Meals on Wheels, Three Men, and a Preacher have continued to do ministry. Worship has remained over live stream. VBS was not canceled like most churches did. And the youth programs continued on. The people of this church found solutions when faced with a problem. Yet we can look to the Israelites and the leadership of Nehemiah for guidance during such times. Firstly, when faced with a challenge, a trial, the first thing they did was to turn to God in prayer. When faced with the insults of the enemies in chapter 4, verse 4, we see Nehemiah reaching out in prayer. Hear us, O our God, for we are despised. When the Israelites heard that there were plots of sabotage against them, 
They posted guards, but before they did that, in verse 9, we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet the threat. So they just didn't pray and do nothing. They prayed and took action. Prayers do not replace our actions. They make our actions effective for God's work. Next, they were constantly reminded that Nehemiah, that God was with them. In the middle of the challenge of rebuilding the wall, Nehemiah reminds the people in verse 14, don't be afraid. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And finally, when the work seemed to be too much, that it was all falling apart, did they stop? Did they panic? No, they adjusted their plans, remained calm, trusted God. In verse 10, we read, Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. And constantly the enemies were attacking them while they were trying to build. So they were tired. No one was cleaning up the mess caused by the renovation. And these Samaritans were trying to kill them even while they were working. Can you imagine these men building the wall, constructing it, and looking over their shoulder to see if any flying arrows are coming? How can you work like that? That's a predicament. But they were, maybe they, they felt like, well, we're biting off more than we could chew, taking on this project. We should have never taken on this project. Too many things are going against them. But did it stop the Israelites? No. Nehemiah first reminded that God was with them, and he adjusted. He separated the men and, and gave them specific duties. Some were builders, some were soldiers, some were guards. And they didn't get, just get discouraged and quit. They adjusted. And then Nehemiah did something brilliant, very brilliant. He had the men staying inside the walls, positioned where they could see the wall. They could see slowly the wall taking shape, the gaps in the wall being filled in. They could see the vision being fulfilled right in front of them, keeping their eyes on the dreams that gave them encouragement and hope to continue the task. Yet, as the Samaritans and Ammonites, they saw the gaps being closed too, they became discouraged, disheartened. Their power to disrupt slowly fizzled away. And we can say the same thing about the voices inside that will discourage us on this journey. As we see that vision being realized in our church, the negative spirit of disappointment, frustration, hopelessness, and anxiety will slowly fizzle away as we see that vision taking place taking hold we will encounter hardships but that does not diminish that it is still God's vision for this church we will see the gaps being closed in the ministries as we see people wearied from COVID coming back wearied by life coming back to church as we see those who are unchurched coming to the church to experience the love of Christ in their lives and the lives of their families. We will see those gaps being closed as we hear the voices of children again on Sunday morning and on Wednesday night. As we see the excitement of the youth, the young people in our church and the youth ministry and, and see how they're drawing closer to Christ in their lives. We will see the gaps being closed as we continue and grow our outreach ministries and we start sending people out again in mission trips. We will see the gaps being closed as we gather again for Bible study, for life groups, as, as people gather together, they share their ups and downs in lives and share in the community where they see God moving. We can see the gaps being closed as we see the imagining more project take shape, making our worship space, this worship space in the Family Life Center more appealing than they already are to invite, attract new people to this church. And we can see the gaps being closed as we see people flocking back to the church, feeling welcomed, being a part of the community of St. Andrews United Methodist Church and experiencing God's grace through a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Yet I must bring up one important, immediate, urgent attention to, to you this morning. The people of Israel had to start with a solid foundation before they could build that wall and close the gaps. The church needs to start with a solid foundation before it can strive for its vision and reach its potential in closing those gaps. Over the last few months, our financial situation, our financial footing foundation has been shaken and uh, uh, giving has greatly subsided during COVID. We must get back on a solid financial foundation. Otherwise, the vision will be in rumble, rubble. We have organized a stewardship team to, to uh, encourage generous giving, to plan out strategies uh, for giving. 
Yet the leadership of this church and I are asking you prayerfully to consider building back our financial future, our financial foundation, either by your regularly giving or, or even the possibility of making one-time generous gift to contribute to the solid foundation of this church for which we, we can grow and blossom. Now, I know a lot of you, many of you have suffered financially during this pandemic, but all we ask of you is to consider it prayerfully, giving generously to the general budget. You can co contribute online. You can contribute in the back of the baskets if you're here in the sanctuary. Uh, you can mail a gift to the church. Or I will even drive by your house and pick it up, okay? <laughs> Just give me a call. So. Nehemiah in 4.14 reminds the Israelites why they're even doing this. Why are they working so hard to build? And it is, I quote, for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. And we need to be reminded of this as well and even expand on it. Why do we want to strive to fulfill the vision of St. Andrew's United Methodist Church, the vision to reach people with Christ's love, create Christian community, and serve others as followers of Jesus Christ. It's not just for us listening here today, but it's for our children, it's for our grandchildren, it's for the great-grandchildren, the great-great-grandchildren of this community so that they can experience the grace of God through the love of Jesus Christ for years to come. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're going to continue worshiping with a time of prayer. And we're going to begin with just a little bit of silent prayer. Because the reality is, is when you're feeling a bit hopeless, when you look around and you don't see things changing like the way you thought they would, it's, it's hard to be excited about a vision. It's hard to imagine God bringing it about. We are normal. We, we look at what we see around us and we do lose hope. So as we begin a time of prayer, I ask that we all have a little bit of silent prayer, and you begin to ask God to ignite hope in your heart, hope in him. Not each other, not the leadership, but hope in God, because it is God who brings the true and the everlasting hope. Let's begin with silent prayer. Loving God, it has been hard to have hope lately. It feels like this pandemic just keeps dragging on. And now it appears to even be getting worse. Father, we're weary of all the changes in our lives, and now we're coming upon a Christmas season that will be different. We long for normalcy. We long for um, the fear to, to be able to have an answer. That is like so much of life. We spend so much of our lives waiting, waiting for things to change, waiting for things to get better. But the reality is, God, is that we are simply waiting on you, on your mercy, on your grace. And then all through the season of waiting, you walk with us. You guide us. You keep us safe. You, you pour grace into our lives, whether we recognize it or not. Lord, help us to have eyes to see the, the, the spaces where you have blessed us so that we might be a grateful people. Loving God, help us to be beacons of hope to those around us, our family members, those in the community. Help us to engage them in the life of this church and in the ministries that are still available. Help us to, to remember that that is our calling on all of our lives, to bring hope even when we're discouraged that you can still use us, even when we're overwhelmed by the holes in the wall, the reality is that you can still use us if we're willing. So help us, Father God, to see the spaces that you are offering for ministry and then give us the courage to step into them. Loving God, I lift up this community. Father God, it is a community in need of you. I lift up our world. 
We need the hope of Jesus Christ. We need the hope of the Advent season. Fill us with your hope. Help us keep our eyes firmly focused on you. And help us to be the people that you have called us to be here at St. Andrews. And now in one spirit, may we pray the words that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to our time of stewardship, whether you're giving through the apps online or if you're giving through the baskets in the back of the sanctuary following the service, I remind you that the first gift God asks of you is for you to give him your heart and then to give him of the gifts of your life. Those that have made the quilts have used their talent and their passion. Where is your passion? What is it that God is calling you to do to serve him this day and to give him from the first fruits, to share with him the blessings that he has shared with you in the bounty you have received?
us join our hearts in prayer. Father, we're so grateful for all that you have blessed our lives with, health and talents and abilities. And all you ask of us is to give a return of that and sharing it with others. Help us truly to grasp the vision of knowing Jesus as our Lord and living our life so that others can see his presence in us and sharing that invitation to others to come to know him as Lord of their life. We come, Lord, giving ourselves, our time, our talents, and our possessions to be used for the building of your kingdom. And we ask it in the holy and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand for the closing hymn. And now receive this benediction. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.